Throughout A Song of Ice and Fire history, we're aware of many houses that have gone extinct in their entirety. Noble houses such as Durandon, Gardiner, and Hor went extinct during the conquest of Aegon. Harrenhal has wiped out many a line via its curse, or supposed curse. And we know in the main series that several other lines have gone extinct more recently. In the TV show, it's taken a step further, as all of the Tyrells, and likely all of the Lannisters, will be wiped out by the end of the actual series of events of the main series. In the books, that is not the case, but there are still a number of houses that have died out. Today, we're talking about the opposite. We're talking about the birth of a brand new noble house. This union of a northerner and a wildling that takes place in the most recent book towards the end that ends up creating a new noble house that might end up ruling a portion of the north. Today, we are going to talk about House Then. The Thens actually do appear in the Game of Thrones television show. They're the bald guys who are part of Mance Raider's wildling army. They're cannibals, and one of them serves as a mini-boss for Jon Snow during the Watchers on the Wall, the penultimate episode of Season 4. However, in the books, as many things are, the Thens are much more interesting and much more multifaceted and layered. Their culture is super interesting and has very distinct ties to elements of Westeros that very few other groups can claim, and it's, it's really a great, interesting group of people. And hey, before we jump into the history, I'd really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. It helps me go to the channel, and it just helps me feel good, so I'd really appreciate it. That specific cultural connection comes from the First Men. As their name would imply, the First Men were the original inhabitants of Westeros, at least in terms of humans, until they were driven north by the Andal invasion. Because of that forced migration, many of northern cultures end up resembling the culture of the First Men. However, the Thens claim direct descendants from exclusively the First Men. And this can be seen in their language. They speak the old tongue rather than the common tongue. That being the language that the First Men originally spoke, as opposed to the language that the Andals brought with them that is now commonly used in Westeros. This archaic, lost language gives them quite a unique place in terms of the culture north of the Wall. They're the only people who are able to communicate with the Giants, which is, as the name would imply, a massive race of people who are dying out at this point. They speak exclusively the Old Tongue, and the Thens, being sort of a middleman between the Giants and the rest of the Wildlings, are able to bridge that gap and communicate, as all groups are trying to come south, first as a part of Mance Raider's army, and later just as part of the larger Wildling cause that negotiates with Jon Snow. The Magnar of Then acts as a leader to their people, and they're considered more of a god than a man. It's because of this kind of divine devotion to their leader that the Thens are such savage fighters. They believe that they are trying to die defending their deity that is protecting them and protecting their families. They also have systems of laws and lords that are almost very similar to the laws and lords south of the Wall in Westeros. Because of this, they have a bit of a strange reputation with the other free folk. The Thens' relationship with other wildlings is also complicated by their advanced equipment as compared to their contemporaries. They have bronze, which other wildling groups really don't. They have bronze helms, axes of bronze, and these spears and shields and armor even sometimes. It's really unique as compared to other wildling cultures, and because of this and because of their discipline, they're often very feared and one of the predominant groups north of the Wall. The Thens have also picked up several tactics from the Night's Watch themselves, using bronze-banded war horns to warn each other about the approach of the Night's Watch, and I assume the approach of the White Walkers as well. The first time we meet the Thens on page is through the eyes of Jon Snow, who so attempting to join the Wildlings and gain their trust in order to pass information back to the Night's Watch. We meet Steer, the current Magnar of Then, who was defeated in battle three times by Mance Raider, until he eventually joined Mance Raider's army and cause to move the Wildlings south. Jon Snow accompanies a hundred Thens, including their leader Steer, south of the Wall in the hopes of attacking Castle Black from the south, while Mance assaults from the north. Unfortunately, Steer does die in the battle, as he does in the show, and this attack does ultimately fail when Stannis intervenes. As of the beginning of A Dance with Dragons, the most recent book in the series, the Thens are in a very complex political situation. Many of the wildling groups are trying to move south of the Wall in order to escape the threat of the others. And the Thens are no different. They have a new Magnar, Sigorn, who's the son of Steer. And he is essentially trying to negotiate on behalf of his people to find a way to get south of the Wall. Jon Snow wants to provide this and is looking for many different ways to approach it and eventually lands on the idea of creating a new noble house. Before we get to exactly what happens there, we have to go back a bit and go into the history of another noble house, one that is very much in decline. House Karstark has a very storied history in the north. They're a cadet branch of the Starks themselves, and they've fought alongside them for centuries and centuries. They rule from the castle of Carhold, and their lord at the start of the series is one Rickard Karstark, who goes south to fight alongside the king in the north, Rob Stark. 
At the beginning of the series, Lord Rickard Karstark has four children, Harrion, Eddard, Torin, and Alice. The three boys accompany him south with Rob, and in doing so, two of them, the middle two, Eddard and Torin, are killed by Sir Jaime Lannister during the Battle of Whispering Wood. This sends Rickard into a vengeful rage that carries him through the next two books. In A Storm of Swords, he executes two Lannister prisoners as a, uh, essentially, revenge for releasing Jaime Lannister, and because of this, Rob ends up executing him, much as he does in the show. Because of this, the Karstarks are left without a leader at that point, and the war essentially goes on without them. They return home to Carhold, not playing any further role in the War of the Five Kings. The new Lord of Carhold, Harrion, has no chance to claim his title. He's captured during the War of the Five Kings at the Battle of the Green Fork by a hedge knight. He's then kept at Maidenpool, where he's remained for the past five books. Because of this, some people think that he's not likely to get out, as there are a number of other wars going on, and it seems unlikely that prisoners in at least that specific region are going to get released. So the title of Lord of Carhold is very much in jeopardy, at least according to several characters in the story. Arnulf Karstark is the uncle of Lord Rickard, and he has a plan to claim Carhold for himself. He declares for Stannis Baratheon as soon as he hears his great-nephew is captured, in the hopes that he will execute his great-nephew and essentially be able to marry Alice, the one remaining daughter of Lord Rickard, to his son Cregan, in order to bond the two links of the family together and give his line Carhold going into the future. However, Arnulf ends up wanting to betray Stannis Baratheon for the Boltons in the hopes that they will reward him Carhold, and this ends up back backfiring on him as it's discovered by Stannis in the Winds of Winter sample chapter from Theon's perspective. Melisandre has a vision during a dance with dragons of a gray girl on a dying horse, fleeing north to the wall, escaping a marriage. Jon Snow initially believes this to be Arya Stark fleeing from Ramsay Bolton, but it turns out that it's Alice Karstark who's fleeing from her potential marriage to Cregan. When Jon Snow hears of Arnolf's treachery and plan to betray Stannis and take Carhold for himself, he decides to make a marriage pact that will hopefully help bind the North and the Wildlings together all while freeing Alice from this marriage pact that she really does not want to be in. In John's 10th chapter in A Dance with Dragons, we see a rare happy sight, a wedding at the edge of the world between a northern lady and a wildling of Then, The Magnar of Then, Sigorn is being wed to Lady Alice Karstark, creating the brand new house Then, in the hopes that it will bind the wildlings and the northerners together against the common threat of the others in order to hopefully bridge their great cultural divide. House Then's new sigil is one of my favorite in the series, because it's really interesting and has a lot of layers to it. At first glance, it very much echoes the Karstark sigil, which is a white sunburst on a black field. This is a red sunburst on a white field with a bronze disc in the middle, and it actually matches up to elements of culture very, very well. It has the Karstark heritage from Alice. The fire represents the light of R'hllor, which is the god under which they were married, as Melisandre is the one who did this ritual. I didn't know she was ordained, but she probably got her degree online. And additionally, this bronze disc in the center is meant to symbolize the culture of House Then, as they are very much tied to this bronze from which they gain their weapons and certain aspects of their culture that make them unique from other groups of wildlings. House Then doesn't currently hold any lands or any titles, but that might change in the near future. Arnolf Karstark and the rest of his family have been captured by Stannis Baratheon, are likely going to be executed due to betraying him, if the One True King's methods for dealing with treason haven't changed at all, which I very much doubt they have. Stannis doesn't change much. Additionally, the one remaining brother that Alice has left is still being held at Maidenpool and will likely be executed at some point in the future, or just killed in battle. So, if I had to bet, I bet House Then is going to be a new noble house to emerge at the end of the series, which I really like the idea of. We know that The Winds of Winter is going to be a very bleak book, as Martin has said many times. I expect several great houses to die out, and even more minor houses. And it's nice to see this one new house that might remain, a true point of unity between the cultures of the First Men, the Northerners, and the First Men from which they both descended. House then also has a pretty unique set of loyalties for Northern House. First and foremost, I imagine they'd be loyal to Jon Snow, as he was the one to arrange this marriage, but they're also uh, essentially formed in the light of R'hllor and are tied to the Fire God, which is unique for Northern Houses. And additionally, this marriage was made under the authority of Stannis Baratheon, swearing them to the one true king regardless of how his pursuit of the throne might end up, which does not seem to be very well. I don't think he's going to end up on the Iron Throne. 
So this has been the video on House Thin. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if there are any houses you want to see me cover in the future. I really enjoyed doing this and the peak video, and I, as people seem to enjoy the last one, so hopefully they enjoy this one too. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this great noble house and how you think it might play out in the winds of winter. And I'm really excited to make more videos for you in the future. I'll have another one coming out next week. And yeah, I uh, look forward to talking to you all in the near future. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe because that does really help me grow the channel. And yeah, I will see you soon.